I'm, I'm not ready to recommend it yet, but I assume I will in some time. Yeah. Which, in fact, now, I mean, today is a great day because today my social security check is deposited. <laughs> well, I want to welcome everybody to this Zoom study with Dr. Meyer, and we'll get going with that study in just a bit. Thank you all for uh, participating. We have more than it might appear as I know that the uh, Black Hill Circuit uh, and the Sioux Falls Circuit are all meeting together, and so there would be, what, eight or ten in each of those settings at least, and then perhaps also uh, another circuit as well. Uh, anyway, we're just glad that you are here. We're really glad that Dr. Meyer is willing to uh, be with us to teach us and to, I think, maybe maybe we'll help him too uh, as, as we consider the, the wonderful uh, message of First Peter. Um, so we have pastors in the district with us today. We have uh, DCEs. We have board of directors members. We have Skylar is on online with us, Skylar Borglum, and a few other friends as well. So we appreciate that. And especially, we do want to welcome Dr. Meyer. A few uh, announcements uh, as we get going here. I would remind you that, well, if we had had our district convention, it was would be over by now, uh, which it would have ended yesterday. But none of you showed up, so thank you for getting all the reading all the mail and and being where you're supposed to be instead of in Sioux Falls yesterday. Appreciate that. Um, of course, we will be gathering in Sioux Falls December fifth through the seventh, Lord willing. We will do that. Uh, the one thing I want to say about the convention is we're still waiting for some delegate names and contact information from some congregations and parishes. Julie says maybe we have 80% uh, participation so far in reporting. So we'll just look for, we'll extend that February 25th deadline a little bit longer for you to get your delegates in. I mean, certainly, uh, there's, there is time for you to do that, to make sure those delegate names, including your own pastors, you know, your delegates as well. We need to know <laughs> your contact information too while we have that, but we need to know that you'll be at the convention. Uh, other thing I wanna say is call day is coming up, April 27th at Fort Wayne, April 28th at St. Louis. So far, we've been promised one uh, alternate route vicar, who will be placed in our district, and one, one pastor, one candidate, both from the St. Louis Seminary. So those announcements will be made on April 28th, three o'clock service for vicars, seven o'clock for pastors. Darren Olson, our executive secretary, has a few announcements for us. You'll have to, by the way, everybody will have to mute, unmute themselves if they wish to speak, but keep yourselves muted otherwise. Darren, please. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to give you a couple updates on some events that are going to be happening here in the next couple of months. Um, first one is coming up actually this Saturday there at Mount Calvary and Brookings. They're having an elders training workshop, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can find the information of, about that on the events page of the South Dakota District website. Uh, so go there if you're interested in having your elders go through a little bit of training. Again, that's this Saturday at Mount Calvary and Brookings. Um, we are set to go for our respite on the river retreat. That is uh, June 7th and 8th uh, in Pierre. Uh, online registration is now open and available to you on the district website under the events page. Uh, when, you, when you fill out the online submission uh, for registration, the page will refresh and you should see a little note that says, congratulations, you are registered for the respite on the river retreat. Um, Information on hotel reservations are there on that events page. Um, you are required to make your own hotel reservations, but the district will cover the cost of one night stay for you and your family if they attend. So, uh, but you will have to call the hotel and make the reservation yourself, uh, but the district will cover up, uh, cover the cost of one of those nights at the hotel for you. Also look in the future if you register for the event for a sign-up sheet to come out for some uh, pre-planned events that we have 
uh, for that Monday afternoon. Uh, we have some time set aside for golf. Uh, if you want to do that, we have, uh, we're lining up some boats and fishermen to take you out on the river and do a little fishing if that's something you want to do. Uh, Brian Zabe is uh, someone who works for uh, the state of South Dakota in their uh, policing unit. And so he's going to take us through the academy if you want to take a tour of the academy and, and do all of that kind of stuff. So we have a number of things planned. Uh, so if you register, look up for, look for a sign-up sheet to come uh, sometime in the near future so that you can sign up to participate in any of those events if you want. Uh, otherwise, that Monday afternoon is free to you. Uh, if you don't want to participate in any of those events, you're more than welcome to, to just spend some time on your own uh, doing anything that you find uh, worthwhile. Uh, also want to remind you of uh, a continuing education opportunity coming up in July at St. Peter's Church in Wentworth. Uh, Adam Welton is hosting Dr. Adam Francisco, who will be presenting on apologetics in the 21st century. Uh, so if you're interested in that as a continuing education opportunity, uh, that'll be in July. Registration information was emailed to you earlier, but again, on the events page of the district website, you'll find more information on how to register uh, for that. Then just wanted to let you know that we are planning to have a fall pastors conference in October. Uh, so that'll be October 4th through the 6th in Rapid City. Uh, so you can plan on that taking place. Um, we'll kind of see uh, what, what COVID has in store for us as we go in the coming months to see what kind of mit uh, mitigation measures we have to take. Um, but we will plan to go forward with our fall pastors conference, October 4th through the 6th in Rapid City. So just a bunch of things that are going to happen now. You know, things are going to start to pick up again. Events are going to be taking place. And so plenty of opportunities for us to get together and uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ and learn together uh, and grow together in our faith. And so uh, good to see you today, Dr. Meyer. Uh, looking well. Retirement suits you, right? But anyway, uh, so God's blessings to us today as we go forward with this. Look forward to seeing you guys sometime in the near future. Okay. Thank you, Darren. And so we are pleased to have with us today Reverend Dr. Dale Meyer, uh, immediate past president of Concordia Seminary. Served there for, I don't know, 15, 18 years. I'm not real sure, Dale, how long you were there, but he is a New Testament scholar. Uh, he taught New Testament at the seminary, still, still is, I think, doing some teaching at, well, I know you are, doing some teaching at the seminary. Uh, also has taught homiletics. Some of the guys on the call today, on the Zoom today, I'm, I know took homiletics with, uh, with Dr. Meyer, and that's why they're such outstanding preachers in the South Dakota district. Uh, <laughs> a para, uh, Dale has been a parish pastor. He has been Lutheran Hour speaker, and uh, now he is retired and trying to figure out what that means. But his dear wife Diane helps him to know what that means. And uh, Dale, we're really glad to have you today as you bring us some resurrection refreshment from First Peter. But before you begin, uh, I'd like to start with a word of prayer, if we could. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that uh, Dale is with us and that we get to hear from your holy word through him, through your servant, Dale Meyer. So bless him as he leads us in this study today. Bless us as we take in this refreshment from, uh, from St. Peter, uh, that one who walked with you, who talked with you, who, uh, who certainly um, is like us in so many ways. And uh, and so, Lord, today we want to, to learn more about this life of living in a, in a time of difficulty as, uh, as exiles in this world, as we await the, the life to come with you in your uh, presence, in person, with you forever. Uh, oh, Lord, now bless this, this time of study. In Jesus' name, amen. Dale, take it away. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, it, it's... Good to be with you. It's good to see Darren. I, I fondly remember our trip to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and I, I, I trust that whatever <clears throat> you might have experienced there, you're using well in your position now. The title Resurrection Refreshment is, is I just pulled that out of President Seiler's email. And whether or not it, this is going to be Resurrection Refreshment for all of you, um, time will tell. A, a couple responses to things that were said in, in the last minutes. 
we've been blessed that enrollments have increased, at least at the St. Louis Seminary. Fort Wayne has too. Uh, it shot up a lot with the present class. Uh, it's it's going to be an increase for next year, although not as large as this year. But as you know, district officials know better than anyone, we've got a lot of vacancies and we need to keep the recruitment a message in front of, of congregations and especially young people. A, a, a second little tidbit is that one of the blessings of COVID has been that seminary uh, continuing education has really gone online. We still still will do in-person presentations, but, but what you and I are doing today is one of the blessings that, uh, that we have. So as you go to your circuits, your congregations, I know that seminary professors are very agreeable to uh, getting online with whatever group that you have and making presentations. It's, it's easy, you know, we don't have to get on a plane and fly into uh, South Dakota, for example. We can do this and, and, and it increases the, the, the reach of continuing education events. You have a handout and Scott has it on the screen and there is far more material here than, than I will be able to cover in the allotted time. Job number one in, in recruitment, in recruitment, in retirement uh, is the Concordia commentary on First Peter. And I work on that down here in my man cave. I do not have an impressive background like many of you do. Um, you can see my tools in the back. The furnace is off to my right. My books are on the other side of the furnace. I'm, I'm down in the basement where Diane thinks a retired husband should spend a lot of his time. Uh, so there's more material here than, than I'm sure we'll cover. It breaks down into four basic parts. An analysis of, of where we are at today as far as the decline of the church in American life. Uh, secondly, First Peter's presentation of Christ. And I think that is, you don't have to go there yet, Scott, that's okay. Uh, I find that challenging uh, just to me personally as I reflect back on my ministry. The third part is, is the message of the congregation. And the fourth part is the unique role that the congregation has in the 21st century compared to the 20th century. So this is all, all, all in the handout and, and, and we'll follow it. I'll start with where we're at today. And, 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 and students who have had me, or at least more recently, have, have known that one of my mantras is, it's a great time to be the church. And I really believe that. But we are not in Christian America when, when church life was different. So we have before us an opportunity. There are three quotations here. There, I, I could have pulled up many more. Cultural the changes and decline have brought a gloom over the church. Before COVID came, you know, I did a lot of traveling and, and speaking, and, and there's a grief in the church about changes that have come upon us. This quotation is from uh, George Will's new book. It is wise to worry about the political consequences of what Matthew Arnold called the melancholy long withdrawing roar of faith leaving the culture and leaving it susceptible to feverish quest for redemption through political action. We're seeing that in spades right now. Secondly, from a, a, a relatively new uh, online source, The Bulwark, American religious belief and practice have been overtaken by a spiritual ennui, boredom, weariness, and also by drift. And I see that in our congregations too. You know, we're grieving what has been lost 
and and we're not energetic about the future in a, in, in, in a way to be energetic at, at this time. But here in, in the third quotation is where I think the opportunity comes up. Leonard Pitts is a, is a column writer with the Miami Herald. Small wonder the church is shrinking. This is in response to the Gallup poll, which just came out. And yet, even when they feel down by the, when they feel let down by the church, as when people feel let down by the church, seekers don't stop seeking. Note the Gallup reports that as many as 87% of us still profess belief in God. That's a minor miracle. You might even call it good news. And it speaks to the challenge and opportunity facing every preacher watching a congregation dwindle. Yes, the church is shrinking, but they know God is not. So this is a great time to be the church, in my opinion, you know, because of, of the new and unprecedented opportunities that are before us. So how did we get here? We have an opportunity to teach parishioners. And as I speak on this topic, especially the lay people, they kind of they nod their heads and say, oh, yeah, okay, because they don't know what's been going on in the broader culture, except that they don't like it, okay? Christian America is gone. Uh, I grew up in Christian America, a lot of us did. And so, uh, well, here's an example. Carol Euchre and I went to the same congregation and the same parochial school. Okay. Then we went to Big Bloom Township High School, public high school of over 3,000 kids. What we experienced in the public arena was complementary to what we experienced in, in our church and parochial school. It was Christian America. You know, in my mind growing up, um, the two kingdoms were kind of homogenized. You know, the Missouri Synod is the kingdom of God. Martin Luther is like Jesus. You know, the church, dot, dot, it was all homogenized. Well, that's gone. That Christian America, quote unquote, is gone and it's not coming back. So when we see now for the damage that's been done to the Christian reputation by, for example, January the 6th, uh, and, and that damage is significant, it's not the only occasion of damage. Um, the sex scandals in, in, the, in the Roman Catholic priesthood have, have done damage. But, but when we see that, we, we know that the world we grew up in is gone. And there are a number of reasons. I've listed seven. The digital revolution, it's amazing. I walked up to a student shop. And I said, you know, that's all fat, it's going away. Carbon paper is gonna come back. And he looked at me and he said, Sir, I don't know what you're talking about. There've been three great revolutions in history as I read. Uh, one was the invention of the alphabet. The second was the invention of the printing press. And now we're right in the middle of the digital revolution. Another reason is the end of the age of reason. This goes, this is from the enlightenment and it benefited the Missouri Synod, uh, the age of reason in this way that everything was thought through and presented rationally. And the Missouri Synod is able to do that as well as anybody. And so uh, this is gonna be interesting to, for you to hear Dr. Francesco's uh, presentation on apologetics. We know in the Missouri Synod how to present propositional truth. What's changed is that doesn't matter anymore to a lot of people. And so how do we witness to the faith is, is, has become a real, real challenge. And I don't think our church as a whole has, has made that transition either. The age of reason was, was already starting to fall apart in the 20th century. 
but it's really on us now. Hyper individualism. And we see that in the United States all the time. Luther did a lot to cause to, to, to raise up individualism. And I'm not and I'm certainly not blaming Luther. But the version that we have in it in the United States is on steroids. Don't you think that you're going to tell me what to do, what to believe, how to act? Okay. And, and we see this all, all the time on the news. We experience it in our lives. But the other side is a countervailing force. That's centralized government. Just think how the federal government has grown. Think about, and I'm not being, well, maybe I am being political, but, but the proposals by President Biden about, uh, about COVID relief and infrastructure Look at how the, the centralized federal government is continuing to expand in our lives. Well, the central government doesn't care about individuals, despite what they say. So you've got hyper-individualism and centralized government, which are two trends going in the opposite directions. Partisan polarization. America no longer has a Judeo-Christian center that it had uh, in the 20th century. And the elite domination of media and universities, that goes back decades, but, but elite, liberal, anti-Christian uh, thoughts and philosophies are entrenched in, in many of our schools, and it's not gonna go away very fast. Here's the one that I'll pick up toward the end of the presentation, number seven, the minimization of mediating institutions, including congregations. Across the street from my old house here in Collinsville, Collinsville is like 12 miles from the Mississippi River into Illinois. Across the street is the American Legion. And every day, veterans, come, or at least pre-COVID, would come to the Legion, get together, drink beer, talk. On Fridays, they put on a fish fry that half the town comes to. On national holidays, they have parades and displays, da, da, da. Well, that Legion is a mediating institution. It sits between individuals and the broader culture. And so when, a, when a, a veteran goes to the American Legion as an individual, he goes with his joys, his hurts, his sorrows, his angers, his frustrations, and he gets together with other like-minded people. They talk it through, they socialize, and then he goes out into the world, probably confirmed in whatever the conversation, the message of the Legion is. Well, there are a lot of mediating institutions and the congregation is one. So that you go to the congregation and you gather with like-minded people, you, you experience the social, socialization of the congregation, the teaching of the congregation, and, and that equips or should equip you to go out into this ever impersonal, sometimes hostile world during the week. Well, mediating institutions have been caught in the crosshairs between individualism, which doesn't need anybody else, and the government, which really doesn't care. And so the result is that, that mediating institutions have declined. There, there, there's no mystery sociologically about why our churches are in decline. And, 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 and these are the reasons, of the seven reasons that I've given, and, and there, there, can, there can be more. Now, at the end of this document, you have quotations from some political scientists, and, and you can read them as you will. So uh, B, this is an opportunity. I just love a quotation from Peggy Noonan from a couple of years ago, it's three years ago already. She had reread a book by Dean Acheson. Acheson was a secretary of state under President Truman. And he wrote this book about how the world changed after World War II. Peggy Noonan begins about, and, and she applies that as, as, as a parallel to today. 
And she begins, everyone's in the dark looking for the switch. When you are in the middle of history, the meaning of things is usually unclear. In real time, most things are obscure. And then she quotes Atchison, only slowly did it dawn upon us that the whole world structure and order that we had inherited from the 19th century was gone. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so to me, that captures where we're at today. Now, we've all been in, in hotel rooms where you maybe get up in the middle of the night and you fumble for the switch. You all know the feeling. If that increases, I have learned as you get older. But here's the deal. We're not looking for the switch. We know what it is. We know who it is. John 9, 4, I am the light of the world. And we know the nature of the congregation. First Peter, people who are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So there, the grief that we're feeling, I think, is easily dealt with by calling us back to who we are. Um, and if, if, if you go down to uh, letter number three, this is a great opportunity to discover a new or for the first time that faith and congregation are about Jesus Christ. They're not about the congregation per se. They're not about Martin Luther. Faith is, is, is not about the Missouri Synod. Now those things are all blessings. I'm not putting them down. And I'm thankful for Luther and I'm thankful for the LCMS, and I'm, I'm thankful for the congregation where I've been at for decades, really. I actually now start to go there on weekends. But we're going through a refining time. There's a, a, a historian who has passed away named Phyllis. I can remember if it's Phyllis Tickle or Phyllis Pickle. doesn't matter. But she said that every 500 years, a church has a garage sale. Well, we're in the middle of the garage sale. Okay. But again, Lord Jesus is going to lead us through this. Um, now, so that what we've gone through so far is complicated. And, and I've done a lot of reading, and I wish I had more time to do even more reading about all these things in society. But theologically, the analysis is very simple. Any Sunday school kid can understand what's going on. It's the old phrase, in curvatus in se. We have turned in on ourselves and turned away from God, his gospel in Christ, okay? So it, we, we're just dealing with a first commandment issue here, theologically. It's a great book by Heather Schott Davis, Man Turned In On Himself. This was her master's thesis at uh, Concordia, Irvine. She turned it into this book, and she lists some of the, some of the symptoms uh, in, in our conduct, promiscuity, consumerism, obesity, narcissism, apathy, greed, societal chaos. Each being God leads to chaos. Chaos bounces back to the modern man in the form of increasing anxiety and depression. And she offers stats, and the book is a few years old, on, on anxiety and depression. Um, interpersonal distrust, our self-centeredness turns our fellow man into our competition. My goodness, you can see that in politics all the time. Affinity in virtual communities, we therefore create safe and undemanding simulations of community for ourselves through technology. That's where we're at. I, I will go through the next section and then, then if you have questions or comments, we, we, we can do that, mindful that we've got a lot of ground to cover, but I wanna make sure that, that, that I'm being understood. You don't have to agree with me, but I, I need to be understood. So as we go to the scriptures, one of the things that has really, really jumped out at me is, is our cultural deceits. We don't realize that we have blinders on when we read the Bible, 
Uh, I don't I don't speak Spanish, but mi casa is not necessarily su casa when it comes to reading First Peter. And here are some of the discontinuities. <laughs> let, let, let me, I'll, 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 I'll give you an example before I get into this list of discontinuities. The book of Peter has been, been called a book of hope, hope in suffering. Okay, that's there. But it is interesting to me that the hope that we get in suffering is often applied to, I'm sick, I'm having an interpersonal relationship problem, I'm unemployed, da, 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 da. That reflects a Christian America, okay? Those weren't primarily what Peter was talking about when he talked about hope in suffering. So the, the, what, what you'll see in, in, in a lot of especially popular presentations of First Peter has been conditioned, maybe blinded, by the fact that they originated in quote-unquote Christian America. So now getting back to the discontinuities, we're talking now about the decline of the church. In my younger days, the Missouri Synod had 2.7 million members. Now it's down to 1.9. And again, we the, the, the reasons can be known. But Peter was writing to congregations in Asia Minor, that is modern Turkey, where the Christian message, the Christian congregation was threatened with extinction. And, it, and they wouldn't have been persecuted. They would have just dissolved. It's, it's my belief that most of those congregations, and he, he, he wrote to many, it's a circular letter, were, were synagogues who had become Christian. How that happened, we, we can trace it back to, to Pentecost, okay? And, and, and they had only been Christian for a, a relatively short time. So they were facing dealing with forces that would dissolve their Christian identity of their, of, of their congregation, their, their synagogue. And, and someone will always piously pipe up, well, the, the church is eternal, never perish, da, da, da. Yeah, yeah, right. Except that look at Turkey today and the visible church is almost non-existent best we know, okay? B, they were illiterate. The scholars have estimated that only 10 to 15% of the Roman Empire was literate. Whoa. That makes a whale of a lot of difference on how they received the word, how they processed the word, how they shared the word. Won't get into that. Well, I mean, but we can have a whole presentation on that. They didn't have a Bible, C. Assuming that Peter wrote this, it would have been in the early 60s, and you know, there's a, a lot of isagogical controversy. Did Peter write or did, or did he not? But there, there's plausible reasons to say, yeah, Peter did write it. It would have been in the early 60s. There was no Bible. There was only the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And that's why you see, not only in Peter, but, but in the Gospels, Nonstop quotations or allusions to the Old Testament scriptures because the converts to Christianity or those who were interested in becoming Christians wanted to know if this new message squared with what was in the Old Testament. There was no institutional Christian church. You ask people, what does the word church mean to you today? And you'll come up with all kinds of, 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 of things. And church means the, uh, the congregation I belong to. It means the, the, the worship service. I go to eight o'clock church. It could mean the LCMS, the denomination. Somebody will always say the body of Christ, and that's correct. Well, those institutional understandings that we take for granted did not exist. There was no institutional church the way we commonly experience it. Uh, the, the quotations there, you know, the church in Asia Minor was basically a Jewish sect 
Uh, in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, it's called the sect of the Nazarenes. In the next selection, Acts 9, 2, etc., it's called the people, the, the way, the people of the way. And lastly, in Acts 11, 26, that's where the word Christian first comes up. Acts 11, 26 at Antioch, they were called Christians. And that does occur in 1 Peter at chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, if any of you suffers as a Christian. But our whole institutional understanding, our understanding of the Bible, you know, they would have kind of looked at us and said, what are you, what are you talking about? Sojourners and exiles. Um, the president mentioned that in his prayer. These people were not citizens. They were not citizens. We're, we have universal citizenship in the United States. The Roman Empire did not get universal citizenship until the year 212 AD from the Emperor Caracalla, okay? Yeah, if they were generally lower class and they did not have rights. Americans today get all Twitter pated when they hear talk about submission, especially when it comes to marriage. The, the Christian wife submits to the husband in all things, Ephesians chapter 5. That would not have Twitter painted the recipients of First Peter. I said recipients, they heard it. They didn't read it uh, because they lived in a world where everybody was submitting to somebody else, okay? Gee, this is big. Creedal religion was unknown in prevailing society. Religion was not a matter of personal salvation, but of the common welfare, okay? Christians were viewed as sub subversive because they would not take part in certain things like Corinthians food offered to idol. Um, in 1 Peter, there's a background of emperor worship. It doesn't come up explicitly, but that's there. And this is for the good of the country, you know, of the good of the Roman Empire. There are certain things that we Americans do for the good of the nation. Well, that was it. And Christians were backing off from some of these conducts. So they were regarded as subversive. Uh, personal salvation wasn't the issue. You die, you go to Hades, and you just become a kind of a bodiless spirit. Casper the friendly or the unhappy ghost. Civic religion did not prescribe personal ethics as Christianity does. The philosophers did, the Stoa, the Stoics did, but, but that was a very limited uh, uh, group. Devotion to deity was ritualistic, not a matter of personal piety. The First Amendment, the separation of church and state would have been incomprehensible. They would not, what? What are you talking about? And so also in the 14th Amendment, no due process. Uh, if, 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 if my neighbor, is, is, is a typical Roman, an Asia minor, and he knows that I'm a Christian and he's concerned about me being subversive to the state or maybe he's got it in for me and wants to nail me. He goes to the authorities and says, my neighbor Dale is a Christian and I get hauled in front of the authorities, okay? That's the way the system worked back then. They were called de la torres, informers. And, and that's how it works. So the idea of the 14th Amendment and, and due process being unknown to them. And, and they were in greater peril than we are. There was a, 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 I've got a group of old guys I get together with on Tuesdays and, and we drink Lutheran lemonade and have a cigar. But the discussion yesterday was about a, a bill that's been introduced in the Illinois legislature of requiring all schools, including parochial schools, to teach sexual education, which includes the equality of LGB, whatever all those initials are, abortion, and so on. Well, here in the United States, we have a way to protest that. And, and, and the guys in our group, you know, said, well, you know, this can be litigated. They didn't have that in first century Asia Minor, Roman Empire. They just didn't have that. 
So in short, the recipients were a minority whose cultural context we can scarcely understand. And, and frankly, I, I added scarcely because I, I'm not sure that I, I can't put myself in those shoes. I can just try and understand it. So now there are, I think, three continuities in the rest of the paper. One is Christ. The second, I I, I'm, I'm probably going to change this congregations, not so much congregations as the second big part, but the messaging that, that we have in our congregations. And then third, coping with an overwhelming culture, our, our role as, as mediating institutions. At that point, Mr. President, I will will stop and ask if there are questions for clarification or, or any any brief comments. And I'll have a cup of coffee. Hmm. All right, gang, uh, chime in and ask uh, Dr. Meyer some questions if you'd like. You can do that via chat or just simply speak up. Maybe I'll stop the share just momentarily. <clears throat> Anybody have some questions? <laughs> Does that mean anything? <laughs> okay, we can keep going. I'm 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 fine with with keeping going. Let Let me ask this question, Dale. Did you see Darren Olson's uh, chat? He said. Someone tweeted yesterday that there are CNN churches and Fox News churches, and you can tell which one you're in almost immediately upon entering. I'm not sure if Darren wants to explain that. That's interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know if any of you read my Meyer Minute, but uh, it's on, is it BuzzFeed this morning? Or I forget, maybe it's a Buzz, BuzzFeed has something. I forget what the other one was. And, and it lists quotations from people, why they left churches. And, and what Darren brought up is, is one of the reasons cited for some people leaving the church. Uh, pedophilia was one. There was a whole list of, 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 of reasons. So, Can I respond? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. And yeah, I, I read I read that and one that you had several weeks ago, uh, right after Easter or before Easter, uh, and you uh, encouraged pastors. You wondered if one of the reasons the church wasn't shrinking was because pastors weren't faithfully preaching the word. And I was a little shocked that you would put yourself down like that because you were one of my very best professors at seminary. And I know that no one could get out of one of your classes or uh, homiletic classes without learning to preach Christ crucified. And I know that your graduates would preach Christ crucified, so I was a little bit shocked by your column. Let me turn it into a question. Uh, my question is, why aren't pastors told more often that they can be faithful to the gospel, and despite all their faithful efforts, um, the people are still going to turn away because they are sinful? I can't tell you how many pastors' conferences I've been to where the pastors was chewed out for one end to the other, and never once was it suggested perhaps the reason is that people are sinful, lazy, give excuses, and uh, it's not 100% your fault. Yes, I could do better. Yes, every pastor could do better. Yeah. But have you ever heard that said at a pastor's conference? I personally haven't. I haven't heard it said, but 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 I know that I think all of us a lot of us at least are, are carrying a lot of grief when we see our congregations declining. And there are some situations, you know, it, where a congregation is gonna decline and go out, go out of existence. There are other times when, um, oh, I just heard a, a local story from our church about somebody that just left and went elsewhere. And the reasons were, were exactly the wrong sinful self-centered centered reasons so that happens and 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 carrying the cross i mean this is this is a cross that we pastors carry so yeah it does happen i think one of the things and 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 i think south dakota is probably especially blessed is is church workers generally we need to be encouraged we need to be encouraged because these are not easy times um so if that's any response, 
about my my column. I don't remember which one it was, but maybe I'm just hedging my bets because my judgment is coming pretty close. <laughs> mm. Dale and group, uh, Darren Olson put up the link on, in the chat to that BuzzFeed article that was referenced before. Skylar Borglum has a question. Hello, Dr. Meyer, thank you. It's a two-part question. So I, I really got to know a lot of our district when I was running for office this past year. And one of the, one of the blessings I found is, is going from church to church and pastor to pastor, meeting, meeting people who are truly grounded in God's word. As somebody who is a Republican, I can say my deep concern was, and this wasn't, I didn't see this necessarily in our churches, but just in society in general, a cult-like adoration of our, of our former president. Now, I supported him and I supported his policies, but in no way did I think that he was the savior that that many of my fellow Republicans felt, and these are devout these are devout Christians of, of different stripes and persuasions. Um, so that was that's part one in wanting to to understand what or do you have recommendations on how we can we can talk to our fellow Christians about not adoring and I mean it was to the point where if you did not toe the line with him then you are not a real Republican it was in some circles very vicious and then the other question I have is um, is actually one that that a, a young man brought to me I'm out in DC right now and he thinks that the reason the younger generation has been so afraid with the pandemic is because they don't have any sense of what's going on for their afterlife. And so they are truly afraid of death. I'm in Gen X. And so for me, it's like, well, look, I know my soul is saved and I'm pretty healthy. So, uh, you know, I don't obviously want to get sick, but I'm not going to live in fear. But there's a generation younger than me, what I would, what I would legitimately call the millennials, who are absolutely wrapped up in fear about this. And so if you have any insights on either of those, I'd love to, I'd love to hear it. For me, this is the, the rubber hits the road theology. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, uh, a, a, a number of things and, and feel free to send me an email. But right now, a couple couple quick responses. If you are in D.C., make contact with Senator Braun from Indiana. And his, his legislative director, who is named Katie Bailey, Bailey, Katie Bailey, his LD, and Katie is my daughter. So both of my daughters have worked in DC for a long time, and 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 I've known DC people, and I'm 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 probably like you are. I'm a traditional Republican, and I see the cult thing that has happened, and it's a symptom of where 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 our culture has been going. Now I don't know precisely how you talk to somebody who is into like the shaman, he, he just pops into my mind. I don't know how you get into a dialogue on, on that. I'm sure there are ways, but but off the top of my head, I don't know. Another thing that has happened, and, and, and I, I may or may not have reference to that book, um, American culture has gone back to Neoplatonism. And, 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 and American religion is, is somewhat Neoplatonism. Platonic in that we don't pay attention to the body, let alone the body politic, because when I die, my soul is going to flit off like and become an angel in heaven. You see that in the obituaries all the time. So, so I, I guess the answer is starting inward. Let's educate the church, not in not just in the the, the 140 word tweets that you're a sinner and Jesus died for your sins, but let's start playing it out. What does that mean? So that's kind of a, 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 a general question that may not mean much. I'm, 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 I'm friends and a church member here with John Shimkus, who just retired as the Dean of um, the Illinois House delegation. And, and John said once some years ago, we had him speak at the seminary and he said, you know, he said the two kingdoms is great. But how do you apply that 
to me, to John, when he has to vote. And, and I, I think that's one of the weaknesses. I think the two kingdoms is, is, is phenomenal. Okay? And we see that January 6th being blurred, be, for example. But how do, we, how do we apply those principles to our public conduct? So yeah, you, it's Skyler. Yeah, you, you send me an email because this, this just fascinates me. And George Will's book, I think that'll be right up your alley. Also, uh, Amity Schley's uh, newest book is on um, LBJ's Great Society. And <laughs> I haven't read it, but I wanna read it, okay? It's a good book. She came and spoke at SD Minds and it was well worth every word. Okay, great, great. You know, and, and one of the things I'm, I'm moving on is that it's not just, it, we, we operate with this wonderful law gospel, okay? Well, one of the duties of the law, that one of the duties we have with the law is to show people what's going on and where this conduct is going to lead. Romans chapter one, you know, so God says, okay, you want to be that way? I'll let you go be that way. See where it gets you. Uh, so it's not just, you know, you're a sinner and Jesus died for your sins, which I'm not putting down. I mean, that's, that's the crux of the whole matter, which I guess is a pun. Uh, but, but uh, it's, it's explaining the dynamics of the law. And we are seeing the dynamics of the law in, in our public life, every place we look. Dynamics like in Romans chapter seven, the law multiplies, the law increases wrath. You know, the law does not give proper motivation. All of that, we're seeing all of that now. So let me, with the president's permission, get, get into the, the, the first major section on first Peter at the revealing of Jesus Christ. Cultural deceit that, that we're facing is substitutions for the savior, okay? So, uh, you know, I wrote about that this morning. You know, the economy is, is a substitution for the savior. Pol politics, at least my pile, my kind of politics, substituting for the savior. And one of the questions I'm wrestling with is have we sub subtly substituted the life of the congregation for Jesus, it, I mean, we don't want to. I know that, but coming out of Christian America, maybe that maybe that has happened. So let's look at eschatology in First Peter, the, the last things. Trelch, whom I have not read, but I came across this quotation in the book I mentioned. Pharaoh, there it is, Ascension and Ecclesia. Trelch, sometime way back wrote that eschatology is closed for repairs. Pharaoh, who's a, a, a scholar at uh, McGill University in Canada, wrote the quotation, he know that Jesus no longer stands before us, but only behind us. And that prompts the reflection how much do we stress and celebrate ascension and parousia? My observation, and, 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 and I'm indicting myself here too, is that, yeah, we talk about the end of the world, the return of Christ at a funeral. We talk about it in November when the gurus of the lectionary have put the last things. In, in, in our readings. I don't know how South Dakota is, but ascension services are almost non-existent down here. And, 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 and I think, and, and Farrell makes a great case, they, we really need to start talking more about ascension and the parousia, which is the revealing of Jesus Christ, okay? So this is called inaugurated eschatology, or at least around the seminary, is called already and not yet, or now and not yet. So under C, let's look at how First Peter presents Christ. A key verse is 322. It's actually 21 and 22 that I've quoted. Baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience. And, and what Peter has to say about baptism isn't much but it is certainly quite Lutheran, 
Peter will be glad to know that. Baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it isn't resurrection where we normally stop in, in, our, in our practice of, of, of the life of the church. You know, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And then, then Monday comes. Okay, so what's ahead? Who has gone into heaven is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. That's how 1 Peter presents Christ. B, he soon will be seen again. 113, set your hope on the grace being brought to you by the revealing of Jesus Christ. It's interesting to look at translations of 113 because a lot of, a lot of them say the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But that's not what it says in, the, in Greek. It's present tense. So that you are awaiting, we are awaiting the imminent seeing, return, quote unquote, of Jesus. That's on the horizon. You know, it, it may be in the next hour, it may be in the next thousand years, but, but it's imminent, it's coming when it, whenever it happens. And that is giving us grace in the here and now. This future-looking preaching in the regular life of the church, not only at funerals, but also in, 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 in November, but throughout the year, is something that I haven't done, and I just don't see us doing it. And it's not only us. I mean, we are, as, as mentioned before, we are committed to the Word of God. We are committed to Christ crucified. But here's a dimension that maybe maybe we we need to to think about again okay so so uh he has ascended he is now lord over all everything is subjected to him 322 we don't see it so often but we believe it and the promise is that we will see it again now here's a whole nother issue that that i'm 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 not knowledgeable enough to talk about now but, but where is Christ right now? Where is heaven right now? Um, that's, that's the whole thing that I, I look forward to getting into. And I'm just keep moving. So Peter is focused on the exalted Christ, but he has retrospective looks in, in chapter one, verse two, pre-existence. And, and that's a, here, here's a cultural, it's not a deceit, but when you read chapter one, verse two, oh, there's the persons of the Trinity. But we have to remember the word Trinity hadn't been invited, invented yet when Peter wrote, you know, chapter one, verse two. So there is a Trinity and he talks about it, but the word Trinity here, Peter's talking about the Trinity. Well, that's an anachronistic reading. It's okay. Uh, incarnate, chapter one, verse 20. And then there are three Christological passages. Uh, in chapter one, he looks at the past, uh, in chapter two, he looks at the present. And then in chapter three, which we cited 322, past and present, Christ is resurrected, ascended, glorified. Expectation, hope on an imminent revelation. That, that's the hope. It's not simply to deal with my cancer or my interpersonal problems, uh, but it's, it's the imminent revelation, the revealing of Christ. And that's that's the big hope in First Peter, and now that is a big hope that gives us hope to dealing with cancer in our personal relationships. Da da da. So so I'm not outlawing those things, but again, the way the way Christian America looked at First Peter and hoped is is not not quite on target with what was really happening in the early '60s. In a word, Christ is immediate, in your face, in my face, even though we can't see him. He is before us and not only behind us two centuries ago. I was invited to preach Good Friday here, here at our church in Collinsville. And I said, and I and I I asked, what 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 picture do you have as you worship this Good Friday evening? And well, the picture logically would be Christ on the cross. I said, He's not there. I said, the the, the image in your mind, that's it's fine to have it, but just understand, he ain't there. And, and in two days, when we celebrate Easter, I said, what image will you have? Well, Christ coming out of the tomb. It's fine. That's fine to have that image. 
but he's been out for 2,000 years. Where is he now? He's ascended and he's coming back. So this, this to me is, is, is um, a huge opportunity. Remember, remember early on in the, in the handout, the second quotation talked about ennui, you know, uh, uh, just a, a weariness in the life of the church and, and boredom by you know, those people who are leaving, okay? Well, if, 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 if we start to say, no, he's coming again and very soon, and, and that's our orientation, whoa, that might change the, the energy level in the church. So I'm, I'm, I'm 74, and I've decided that one of my jobs in retirement is studying for death, you know, the Sabbath rest that awaits the people of God. So I'm starting to look forward, okay? And I think the congregation, not only that Christ is risen, and then Monday, Easter Monday, we go back to normal, but but looking forward. And again, I say I have I've, you know, I haven't done this my whole ministry too. D, how is Christ present now? This is interesting. He's, he's present in the Spirit and the Word. How is He personally present? That's something Peter doesn't address. But in one two, by the sanctification, holying of the Spirit. Uh, 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 a professor when I was a student, Robert Bertram, liked to talk about the holying spirit. He makes us holy. 111, the spirit of Christ among them. Uh, he's talking about the prophets there who researched the sufferings and then the glory of Christ. Uh, and, 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 and they were aided, they were guided by the spirit of Christ. Okay? So this is the pre-existent Christ at work before the incarnation. 112, things announced to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven through the ones gospeling you. I made that word up. I'm sure other people have made it up. You know, the, the spell checker will flag it. And in 414, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So he's present by the word, but in, in the spirit and the word of, specifically the word of Christ. We have, just a second. Yes, Diane, I, I am in South Dakota. Listen, you, did you say to pick up something at Snoop? I, you did, I can't remember what it was. No, I don't think so. I don't sure? think so. I don't right. think so. Say hi to everybody in South Dakota. Hi, South Dakota. Sorry, I'm not interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> they needed a break. You know, they're all falling off their chairs. Okay, no, I don't remember that I needed anything. Bye. Bye. One of the things, I'm sorry about that, one of the things I've discovered is that in retirement, I am to be at total disposal of my wife, total at her every beck and call. And I should have done that for 47 years, but now she's coming back with her revenge. Okay, the D2, the problem of Christ's presence and absence. Christ is visibly absent for the time being. We say he's present. He promises to be present. I am with you always. But how is Christ present? That, that's something I, I, I need to, to research. Um, and then a reflection question. Do we present the means of grace as a spirit of Christ working here and now, or just what we do to remember him? One of the frustrations I had before I got deep into Peter is that, that we talk about the Christ event as, as a past tense, 2,000 years ago. Okay, well, that, 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 that's obviously true. But there's a lot of stuff that he is doing now. He's just as active now in his spirit, through the word, and, 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 and not just in the ritual, sacramental ways, but he's very present and active now, we know by faith, that, that can often be a, an aspect of our gospel proclamation. I'm going to keep going uh, here and, and get into the, the Roman numeral four. The, the title is, is from Martin Franzman's hymn, Each Life a High Doxology. And two key passages are one seven, praise and honor and glory at the revealing of Jesus Christ. Revealing is significant. That, that's the word apocalypsis. And it doesn't say the coming of Christ as if he's in another world far off beyond planet 
Pluto or exoplanet Pluto. It doesn't say coming, it says it's the revealing. Uh, N.T. Wright, the popular scholar, says that heaven is God's space. We are in our space. Heaven is God's space. It might, might be the distinction between the visible and the invisible. But, but I'm just pointing out that in Peter, at least, the word is revealing, not the coming. Uh, 2 7, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So let me unpack how each life is a high doxology for the people is to be, is to be for the people in Asia Minor because it wasn't. So then cultural deceits, middle class Americans, that's, that's, that's who the LCMS is, that's who we are. Uh, and yet, as I pointed out earlier, they were not middle class American type people. Another thing is forgiveness. And I'm not saying that this is, is a deceit because it's not. We are right on with our preaching of forgiveness, of Christ crucified and resurrected. Augsburg 4 is, is key. That's, that's the article by which the church stands or falls. Justification of the sinner by grace through faith. Okay. But, but here's a story of Jason the taxi driver that I think can also help energize our proclamation and congregational life. And the story was told to me by one of our profs, Abjar Baku. Um, and he's got an interesting history. He's an expert in Islam. But he tells a story about a, 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 a taxi, a, 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 about a, a young evangelical, gung-ho evangelical, who was out on, I guess, in one of the major cities on, on, on a coast, got into a taxi that was driven by, I don't know if it was Asian or Middle Easterner. Uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and Jason, the gung-ho evangelical, decided this was an opportunity to witness. And so he witnessed about Jesus. And he said that Jesus died to bring us forgiveness for our sins. Well, Jason figured out that the, the taxi driver wasn't getting it. Just it was, he wasn't connecting. And so they talked a little bit more and the taxi driver said, you know, that sounds like an American gospel. That's not, that's not the way we think in my country. They think in terms of shame and guilt, shame, shame and honor, shame and honor. Okay. 80% of the world thinks in terms of shame and honor. Western culture thinks in terms of right and wrong. Okay right and wrong, and for wrong, the church preaches forgiveness, correctly so, okay? But most of the world doesn't think that way. And increasingly in uh, uh, American society, we're seeing shame and guilt. So, you know, I, I do, for various reasons, follow politics, and the Nevada Republican Party censored the Republican Secretary of State, because she, quote, dishonored, unquote, the party. Okay, you see the shame and, 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 and honor at work more and more in our public life. Uh, if you don't agree with me on this legislation, if, if, if you don't agree with me on whatever, shame on you. And I'm not going to enter into dialogue with you. You're on the outs. My classmate, Ron Rolf, served a good while as a missionary in Papua New Guinea. Ron's a great guy. And, 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 and Ron said that, you know, you have two tribes, okay? And let's say that somebody from tribe A kills somebody from tribe B. Tribe B comes back to Tribe A wanting vengeance. They want to get that guy. So that guy obviously did it wrong, but the tribe won't give him up because now it's a matter it's a matter of shame and honor. So we 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 don't think this way, but it's all over us. So the recipients, or again those who heard First Peter, because the epistle would have been read to them in in their synagogue setting, they were shunned and shamed but they were yearning for acceptance. Maybe this is like the young people. Yeah, I, you know, who am I? Where do I fit in? They wanted to be accepted. Most were not Roman citizens. I mentioned that. They were illiterate. Mentioned that. They weren't dumb. 
but they were illiterate. Most were poor. None had power or authority in society. They didn't even have a vote like we have a vote. Some were slaves. Some were, some were wives who appeared to have flaunted the husband's authority. So when Peter talks about and Paul talks about wives submitting to your husbands, you know, that wasn't shocking to them because they already were in a position of submission. Uh, the, the husbands in, in, in four said none had power or authority. Husbands did. Husbands did. But, but, but these wives didn't. And if, and if a wife becomes a Christian and misunderstands the implications of the gospel, uh, she could flaunt her husband's authority. In fact, in fact, one of the, the key themes throughout Peter is he said, don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. Yes, you are free people in, in, in the gospel. And you are going to be honored at the revealing of Jesus Christ. But don't rock the boat. Instead, be out there doing good works. He's, he's not circling the wagons. Uh, seven, many were Jews. The Jews carried a stigma in, in Roman uh, culture, society. Now, the Jews had special privileges. The Romans were not, were not terrible overlords. If, if, if you acknowledge their lordship, okay, they, they'd live and let live. But as, as we saw with, with the Jews, especially in 70 AD, if, if you cause Rome trouble, the boot will come down on you and it'll come down very hard. And then so Jewish Christians and, 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 and God fearers, they carry that, that stigma, but they were, they were recognized. They had special privileges that granted only to them by the empire. They were suspected of being subversive to the welfare of public life. We talked about that. We also talked that they could be falsely accused and punished. They were tempted to find vindication. That's a key word, vindication, by giving themselves to public mores and conduct. One of the things I think, and, and, and I'm glad to see this in our pastor at our church, pat the people on the back. Pat the people on the back. I mean, they know that there's some of their faults, and, and, and we use the law to further enlighten them on, on all of our sinfulness. But I think people want vindication. Shame today, C1. The majority of this comes from Brene Brown, and, and it's, a, it's a book on leadership, but this, what she says in this chapter is, is, I think, very helpful. The majority of shame researchers and clinicians agree that the difference between shame and guilt is best understood as, this, as the difference between I am bad and I did something bad. Guilt, I did something bad. Shame, I am bad. That's a profound insight at least it was for me and and uh, i i suspect young people older people who are depressed and and may even take their lives feel that i am bad and i'm not saying that depression is not a serious psychological issue and 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 needs treatment um, from from person more qualified than than me sitting in my basement i'm I, i'm not saying that but the but the the message of the church is not just guilt, yeah, because we got that, but that in Christ we are vindicated. Um, two, shame is the fear of disconnection. We are physically, emotionally, cognitively, and spiritually hardwired for connection, love, and belonging, and that's what the congregation is to provide. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging, and connection. Shame drives two tapes, never good enough, or who do you think you are? Okay. Um, yeah. And here's some examples from Brown of, of examples of shame. And, and I, I, I shortened her list. The list is longer. This is a challenge in our post-enlightenment culture. The forgiveness of sins is no longer the lens through which many Americans see life and truth. Shame honors replacing guilt, innocence, or in our theology, sin and forgiveness. But the two are connected. So, so don't, don't get Twitter pated here. When you honor God, you obey him. When you dishonor God, you sin. Hence, shame, honor is connected to guilt and forgiveness. And this is very, very clear in First Peter. He does, he does not put shame and, and honor and guilt and forgiveness in opposition to one another. But he really does 
consciously vindicate his listeners and tell them that there is honor coming. Pray, oh, oh yeah, here for, for the political junkies. Number five is anger at being shamed by elites driving many American voters and protesters. So if you look at the last election, you know, the leadership style of, of the president was was rebuked, but Republicans won all the way down ballot. And I'm 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 intrigued. I, I haven't studied it but casually I have, is is that the the the, the reaction that's going on is is people feeling shamed that we have, whether they be in Washington, Springfield, Illinois, or wherever it is, the university, the media, telling us who we are to be and, 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 and how we're so deficient now. I think that's a huge part of the anger that expressed itself, not only in the, in the election, but also in January 6th. You know, Trump was voted out but down ballot, the Republicans did well, okay? So in, in, in Peter is big on praise, one seven. I don't know if he uses that word, a pine on elsewhere. I've, I've got to look at that. So everything here is, is incomplete. Get the commentary when it comes out in 10 years. Honor, look at the times when honor comes up. And, and in two seven and 17, that's a key passage, uh, well, especially two seven. The honor, he says, the honor is to you who believe, but to those who did not believe, it's shame. And then glory, we're going to participate in the glory. Now, the last section, no, no, no. Yeah, the last section, no, it's not the last section, immediacy of holiness. And, and I'm racing now. Um, hope, there you have the instances of hope in the epistle, and it's a verb, which means hope has to be practiced. Yeah, I, I will have students and, and pastors, some, I'll compliment them on a sermon, and, 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 and they say, well, no, God did it. No, God didn't do that. God didn't write that sermon. You did, buddy. And you did a good job. Philippians 2, it's God who works in us both to the will and to do of his good pleasure. But, but hope is something that people have to practice. And that's one of the things that gathering together each week, each week, not just once a month, each week, with the congregation does. It teaches us how to uh, 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 practice hope, encourages us to practice hope. The theme of new birth, the concept of new birth, reborn, is trite. And tr trite meaning, coming from the Latin word tribo, it is so well-worn, what does it mean? If you look at uh, one three is the key, new birth through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. If you look at, for example, Mark chapter seven, under A, the passages that I've listed. And here's the best way that I can say this. We all have, I have deep within me, deep in my being, things I'm ashamed of. And if the things that are deep within my heart, in my being came out, I would be ashamed. So ashamed that, you know, I wouldn't want to be seen again. I'd hightail it out of here, okay? Well, we all have that. Sooner or later, it's going to come out. And hopefully for, for all of us, it'll be later on the last day. B, you stop sinning only when you die. I mean, that's, that's you know, we, we go to the funeral home. We're used to go to the funeral home, pay, pay our respects to the deceased, and you say nice things about the deceased. It may be that the deceased was an SOB, okay? Well, if he was, if she was, that person is no longer sinning because he died. Romans chapter 7. So in C, our substitute took our life, our incurvatus in, say, life, to its only logical end, death. In baptism, D, we are mysteriously united to Christ's death. And that's one of the reasons why the sacraments are called mystery. I don't understand how this happens, that I'm united into Christ's death, that I was, that I was in a mysterious way lifted out of 1947 when I was baptized and I was time traveled back to 30 AD or whatever the year was. And in the same way, I'm, I'm, I'm time traveling to the day of the resurrection of all flesh 
and in between now inaugurated eschatology i'm just i'm i'm living a newness of life i don't get that that's a mystery but but that i think is is one of the things that in this is age when everything is analyzed everything is statistical and we're in trouble every place we look i mean you can't even sleep now without having some app tell you whether you're sleeping well or not well this mystery i think is is it, it, can be is, is a great thing for the church so we are children of obedience here the 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 concept of children comes up four times in one three we have a new birth in 114 we are children of obedience and it's not uh, the, the, the passages say the translations say it's like children of obedience well it's more than like it's as you really are there's the mystery you and i are children of obedience by by baptism i forgot to put here 123 that our, our rebirth is is by the eternal and abiding word of god not by perishable seed but by imperishable seed and then in four as newborn babes desire the pure spiritual milk okay so the the it is a sub theme in Peter this new new birth that will come to fruition we will come to maturity in uh at at the revealing of Jesus Christ uh, uh Richard Baxter was a a a a puritan writer and and he's fascinating to read uh but he talks about we are still in our minority you know you 16 until you turn 16 i guess you're minority or or whatever the year is 18 21 you're a minor well we are still on this on this side of the revealing of jesus christ we are still in our minority the majority comes when he is revealed and we go to the inheritance which is in heaven it doesn't say the inheritance it's chapter 1 verse 4 the inheritance yeah, four. The inheritance is not heaven. The inheritance is in heaven, whatever all that means. Fear of God. I will. I will skip that now. Except, well, no. I'll, I'll just say this. I don't hear talk about the fear of God in our churches. I haven't done it in hindsight the way I should have. But there's two aspects to the the fear of God. One is the first aspect is just natural fear. Something's coming at you that's bigger than you are, more powerful than you are, and you can't deal with it, and it's going to get you. Maybe it's a terminal diagnosis of cancer. Maybe it's a note that your spouse left you. you, you maybe your financial house of cards is, is collapsing. It's coming at you and it's going to get you. And we all know that fear. That's phobos in Greek. There's, there's another, there's a spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum is a similar feelings. You know, I can't deal with this that's coming at me. You know, it, it's, it's bigger than I am. But, but at this other end of the spectrum, this is God coming to help you, not to hurt you. And that's the fear of God. So the true fear of God, and it's in chapter 1, verse 17 of Peter, talks about, the, it, it starts with a primal fear that we all have. But for Christians in the gospel, for those of us who are newly born and, and continue to desire the pure spiritual milk of the word, uh, for us, you know, wow he's coming to help me i mean so the, the fear of god is a salutary thing psalm 34 verse 11 come my children listen to me i will teach you the fear of the lord let me let me wrap up with a function of congregations and i say a function not the main function the main function is presenting the gospel in in in, in worship in bible class in in, in everything that we do and and the means of grace but a function remember the cultural deceit church uh they had those those jewish gentile christians in asia minor had three options to accommodate but to keep the form of religion i and and i can get off on on that uh, parker palmer has has said that a lot of christian leaders are functional atheists i certainly have been at times Oz guinness says that a lot of a lot of our worshiping christians are are essentially atheists we keep the form of religion so that's a temptation peter's uh, recipients could have thrown off the restraints of social convention that I, I mentioned that don't peter doesn't want them to to blow the whole thing 
you know, pick pick your battles, okay? Or to follow the will of God, and that will, may well incur suspicion or worse. Congregations as mediating institutions. Here follow a list of, of passages, but what this comes down to is the opportunity that we have as, as theologians who, who are, are, are caring about our people to show what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a person who is expecting his imminent return. What does this mean as we go out into this impersonal world filled with hyper-individualists, filled with, with an, uh, a, a, a gluttonous government um, where people aren't always going to, they're, they're not always going to give us a fair shake. How do you cope with that? How do you cope with that? And so I think, and while the gospel proclamation is always the main thing, and that's that's why we're, we are so blessed, not only in Lutheranism, but especially in the LCMS, gospel proclamation is a big thing. But what does Jesus look like with his skin on, okay, during the week when you go to work? And I, I, I don't know if I wrote this here, I may not have. Um, Peter does not withdraw. He doesn't circle the wagons. He wants his people to be out there doing good works. 2.11, and then if you look down at D, specific vocational instruction, he talks about how do you, how do you practice subordination in government, it, 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 if you're a slave to your master, a master could kill his slave if he wanted to, okay? To unbelieving husbands or believing husbands to wives, and then in general, and in 3, 8 to 12, he's quoting Psalm 34. So remember, this is a circular letter. It's going to many congregations. Peter probably didn't know most, if any, of them. But the word had gotten to him in Rome that we got this issue going on. So he writes a circular letter. He doesn't give specific instructions. Like in a congregation, you'll have a specific issue that you have to deal with. And you do it on the basis of the scriptures and the guidance of the Lutheran confessions. And, and and what our church what, what our church teaches. So he doesn't do that, but but he wants he you know you be out there in the world, but not of of the world to 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 bring that that in from John. So to wrap this up, and then we have thirty seconds for <laughs> questions. Seven, Scott. Seven. And, and here's, here's what Peter wanted, here's what Paul wanted. I'll start with a, the quotation from, to Barclay. That, that's a phenomenal book too. Striving to be qualitatively different from any other association or value system people experience during the week. About the congregations founded by Paul, John Barclay writes this. The truth of the good news is ineffective unless it takes place within communities whose behavior instantiates its novelty. In other words, are we different? Is our congregation different from the American Legion across the street or any other association that people have during the week? And I'm not putting those associations down, but what is different? And why am I compelled to go to church on Sundays and not just you know, be satisfied with, with the American Legion or what have you? Levin. The ultimate soul-forming institutions in a free society are frequently religious institutions. Traditional religion offers a direct challenge to the ethic of the age of fracture, and that's what we're in. Religious commitments command us to a mixture of responsibility, sympathy, lawfulness, and righteousness that align our wants with our duties. They help form us to be free. I mean, this is, boy, do we have opportunities. Uh, there's two passages from Peter where he talks, he doesn't talk all that much about the congregation, but what he does is, is about faith, hope, and love. And finally, my closing question, is our congregation qualitatively, qualitatively different from any other association people have during the week? How are we different than the American Legion, VFW, Meals on Wheels, Rotary, Quonset, da, 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 Senior Citizen Center? What compels people to be active in our congregation? It's not just Jesus, but I think it's something very much alive about Jesus here and now and the expectation that we are gathered together and going to see him. Mr. President, I apologize for rushing through this, but these all and I all have a life to live. We can't keep going.
by the book <laughs> when it comes. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Meyer. I, we have time for questions, and I don't think we have a, a solid end time here, but uh, with you, I guess we do need to get on to other things in life today. Um, and so just a couple of comments that were put up in the chat section. Uh, so Darren Olson asks everyone here, hope like biblical love is not only a feeling, but an action that needs to be practiced. He, he's asking a rhetorical question. Well, I don't guess it's not a rhetorical question. So biblical love needs to be practiced. Hope is in action too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I, I, would, I would just, I would agree with that. Uh, one, one, one thing is that we in the Missouri Synod are, we, we are doctrinally top, top. Uh, I was for 12 years on the board of the American Bible Society, and that time taught me a, a, a lot of things. But one is when it comes to scholars of the gospel, the Missouri Synod is it, okay? But we talk about faith. But I think we need to talk about hope as well. Hope is just another aspect of faith. It's a future-looking aspect of faith. Okay. Levi, Pastor Wilms down in Yankton asks, you spoke at the start of the, at the start, of the connection between your Christian and public education. I follow this all for the most part as how we as Christians interact related to the world around us. But I don't know who made this quote, and here's the quote, we can't keep sending our kids to Rome and be surprised when they come back as Romans. Thoughts on future generations? Yeah, I, I don't know where the quotation comes from, but, it, but, but it's a good one. As far as the future generations, I'm one of the things I miss is dealing with seminarians on a daily basis, and and um, I know my own my own children are 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 doing all they can to to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I th I think we I think the congregation is where it's at. Um, getting to the future generations. And if, yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't have any immediate wisdom on the top of my head, but young people, well, you tell me, why do we have 70-year-olds running the country? Why do we have 70-year-olds in positions of, of leadership in the church? Why don't we become, and then Scott, you're not even 40 yet. Why don't, why don't we become the storytellers? Instead of tr trying to lead, I remember when, when, when they had the blue ribbon commission to reorganize the synod, and those guys were all in their eighties, seventies, eighties. Let's we've got the stories to tell. I think we need to to trust leadership cautiously to younger people. I'm just spouting now. Thank you. Are there some other questions for Dr. Meyer? You can unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> well, I guess not. Well, <laughs> I hope it all made sense to you. And I hope it's not a downer because I really am optimistic. We, we've got, you know, like the Corinthians, they had everything they needed, Paul says. We've got everything we need to do this. Um, and we are, you know, the tough times we are carrying the cross. Yep. But that's what we're here to do. Peter, Peter consistently distinguishes between the sufferings and the glory to be revealed. And, and right now we're in the, the more on the suffering time, but with the anticipation of glory. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Osmus has a question there. I don't know if it's a question, but maybe just, uh, an affirmation of something that, that I heard or that we see in First Peter, I guess how you bring out how he speaks. I mean, we always speak of the forgiveness of sins and, and, and that's, that's at the bedrock of, of everything that we, we talk about with one another. But to be able to declare who we are in Christ, not just what he's done for me, but who we are. There, there's, a, 
there's a song that talks about God, who's a good, good father. That's who, who you are. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. And, and, and rather than just kind of a, just that sense of, uh, you know, I got these sins out of the way because they got forgiven. I'm a whole renewed child of God. I'm a new creation. I mean, that language is throughout the New Testament. And just, I, I feel our, our, our world so needs to hear of, of that value and the honor that is to come, certainly, but the value that is now. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Aaron. Well, gang, I, I do think we will call it a day, a morning at least. Uh, Dale, thank you so much. And get that commentary written. Uh, tell Diane that people in South Dakota say, just cut him some slack. You know, one less, one last, uh, last honeydew thing a day so they can get that commentary written. Yeah. I often tell Diane, I said, I owe you. And she says, you don't have enough time to pay me back. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to eat my lunch and take my old man nap now. And then <laughs> we'll that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Dale. Uh, let me dismiss you all with the, uh, with the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it, everybody. God bless you.